Well, good evening, church. If you have your Bibles with you, if you can open to Leviticus chapter 13, verse 13. Uh, Jeff, my clicker is just going to be for my computer here, so if you can... I don't have any slides. They didn't make it up. I'm sorry. (laughs) All right. Um, Many years ago, as I was growing up as a little boy, I got to know a young man, and then later on I found out that he and Darwin had been friends. Uh, His name was Anthony, or Tony Turner. Tony grew up in a house where his parents protected him. Uh, they coddled him. They, he wasn't allowed out the house. Uh, uh, he became really pale. And every disease that came about, guess what happened? Even though he was so protected, he got that, he got that disease. And, uh, and then later on, his mother had a few more children in quick succession. I think there was a lot of prayers on behalf of the church on, to let that come about. In fact, I think my father-in-law said, what you need is three more boys... Nine months apart, and she had three more boys, nine months apart. <laughs> and Tony had to grow up really fast because mommy couldn't coddle him anymore. And today, Tony uh, has broken free, and I don't know where in the world he is. I don't think many people know where he is because he could show up at my house tomorrow. He goes all over the world. When we look at Leviticus chapter 13, verse 13, we come up with something just as strange. Uh, The lesson is entitled, Bring Christ Your Broken Lives, So Marred by Sin, which will also be the invitation song. And I want you to think about uh, a group of people outside Jerusalem walls, uh, unclean, very, very unclean, uh, wretched lepers, not allowed to come near anybody. The unpopular or the, uh, the number that you would say is a bad luck number would be 13. And Leviticus has a lot of scriptures on a lot of different things. And Leviticus 13.13, 13, chapter 13, verse 13, is the one I want you to look at. Then the priests shall look, and if the leprous disease has covered all his body, he shall pronounce him clean of the disease. It has all turned white, and he is clean." Can you explain that? When you you just read that scripture right off and you see that, and and, and you're good. Okay, I see some people shaking their heads. That just doesn't sound right. How can somebody who's covered with leprosy, they white with leprosy, be said that they are clean? Well, you know, the same thing can be said when the world looks at us, or Christ looks at us, or God looks at us, and sees us so marred, by sin, so broken, how can anybody look at us and say, clean, 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 clean? How how does that work? You know, it just doesn't make sense in my mind. Let, Let me read it to you again. Then the priest shall look, and if the leprous disease has covered all his body, he shall pronounce him clean of the disease. It has all turned white, and he is clean. You get it yet? Understand yet? When it's raw, when the scabs haven't gone over, then it's an infectious disease. But when the scab goes over, it's no longer an infectious disease. When you and I come into the body of Christ, somehow Christ's blood covers us, covers every part of us, and we are clean, even though we are horribly marred by sin. We are pronounced clean by the priest, by the high priest. So yes, it may sound strange, but how does this work? I'd like to suggest that the only reason and the only way you and I could ever be pronounced clean is in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, we find out about being in Christ. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. If I had to take a newborn babe, and we have a few newborn babes in the church, and I had to hold that newborn babe in front of you, what do you think you would, th- would think when you look at this baby's skin? It's clean, right? How many wrinkles do you think you would find on a baby's skin? Well, maybe when it's just born, it's got some wrinkles, right? But you know what I'm saying? After the baby is filled out a little bit, uh, the baby has no wrinkles. The baby is, is beautiful. The skin is perfect. Now, when God looks at us 
as we become new creatures, he says, wow, that's incredible. And people look at us and say, well, I wish I had no freck, uh, 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 not freckles, but uh, uh, age marks, you know, like so-and-so. Uh, we, we like that idea of being, of being new. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 8 tells us what the goal is. And the goal is to get into Christ. But how do we get into Christ? Isaiah 1.18, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, what? They shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, what? They shall become like wool. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. We haven't changed, but something else has changed. We still have that leprous disease. We're still covered head to toe with awful sin. But, but Christ's blood comes over us and the high priest looks at us and says, clean. And, and the rest of the world can't see that. And, and, and maybe you can't see that. Maybe you're seeing what the devil sees. And you think you are not what you need to be. But you are white as snow. You've become like wool. So the question is, how do we get into Christ? I have a few scriptures that you can run down to get into Christ. When, when you are in Christ, uh, you have a few blessings. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says, you have every blessing in spiritual, every blessing in the spiritual realm. Well, if you have every spiritual blessing in Christ, what do you have outside Christ? Every spiritual blessing is where? In Christ. Where, what happens if you're out of Christ? No spiritual blessings. In Christ, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, there is redemption. So outside of Christ, guess what? No redemption. Inside of Christ, there is forgiveness of sins, Ephesians 1, 7. So what happens outside of Christ? No forgiveness of sins. Inside of Christ, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 2, no condemnation. What happens outside of Christ? Condemnation, you get it? You're picking this up? When you look at the Scriptures and you see something good, think about the opposite. Same as the one we've read, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. In Christ, you're a new creation. Outside of Christ, guess what? You're still the old creation. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. Inside of Christ, you have salvation. Outside of Christ, no salvation. 1 John 5, 11, Inside of Christ, you have eternal life. Guess what? Outside of Christ, no salvation. Well, there are two scriptures in the Bible that tell you how to get into Christ. Romans chapter 6, verse 3, and Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. Unfortunately, the notes aren't up there, but I have the Greek line out so you can see these words. Uh, baptized into Christ. Uh, baptizo eis Christos. Only two places in the Bible you'll ever find that. Only two places in the Bible you'll ever find how to get into Christ. The Greek preposition ace means into. There's no other word in Greek that says into. It's the only one that says into. And there's only two places. First of all, Galatians 3.27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So here's the question. Have you been baptized? If you have been baptized, then were you baptized for salvation? Some of us may say, yes, we were baptized. I know that my mother said I was baptized when I was three weeks or three months old. I have no recollection of that. So I had to come to an age when I could believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of living God. I could repent. There's no repentance as a three-month-old baby. I can't say to a congregation, I confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. How can a baby say that? Other people were baptized later on because they thought they were saved. Baptism is what puts you into Christ. If you were baptized after you were already saved, you were just made wet. The purpose of baptism is to place you into Christ. And so that's what you need to know. The only thing you need to know before you are baptized is before I'm baptized, I'm lost. If I have somebody come forward and they say they want to be baptized and I don't have much time to ask them a question. Let's say they, they come forward and I don't know who they are and they're sitting on the pew here and I have a chance to ask them one question. I ask them this. If you are not baptized tonight, do you think you will go to heaven or hell? If they say, no, I know I'm already saved. 
<laughs> then uh, it would be better for me to give them a ticket to go to a gym somewhere and take a bath, you know, uh, because this baptism is not going to do anything for them. You have to know that baptism is what puts you into Christ. Not my words, not my words, the Bible. The other place you can go is, is Romans chapter 3, sorry, Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who, were, who have been baptized, again, into Christ, were baptized into His death? Again, baptizo eis Christos, baptized into Christ. We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And then verse 5 says this, and, I, and Brian, you made a really good point on this two uh, weeks ago, Sunday morning. For if we have been united with Him in death, like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in resurrection like His. There's only one way that you can be united with Christ, and that is in baptism. The mode is baptism. Let me go back and read this again. We were buried, therefore, with Him, how? By baptism. That's the mode. I didn't make this up. Paul didn't make this up. The Holy Spirit told Paul, till this. And John chapter 3, verse 3, the same way. If you're not baptized into Christ, you're not born again of the water and the Spirit, you don't enter into the kingdom of heaven. You don't see the kingdom of heaven. And so that is something that we cannot get around with. We cannot play around with it because when we listen, the world is saying, the devil is saying, maybe even your conscience is saying, unclean, unclean, unclean. You are a wretched sinner. Stay outside of Jerusalem. Stay outside of God's people. That's what our conscience tells us. Christ says, clean. May say, sound strange to you, may not make any sense, but it makes perfect sense to Christ. One day I was in a hospital room here in this area, and there was a young man who had overdosed on heroin. And uh, I went into his, into his room, and he, he just sat there at tubes, and I asked the nurse, what have you done to him? They said, we've frozen him. We've lowered his, his body temperature. His brain is frozen at the moment. Well, why do you do that? Because while we freeze him, his brain has a chance for the swelling to come down. They are actually stopping this person's life to be able to save the person. Well, it didn't work in this person's case. He had gone too far, and a little while later, we were involved as a church with a funeral, and it was really sad. But in Jesus' case, it does work. It do, it's counterintuitive. It doesn't sound right. I was told many years ago, if you jump into a pond to save somebody, and they grab on you, and they start to drown you, swim down and pull them down with you. It's counterintuitive. That's the last thing your body instinctively says to do, but it's the only way you can save the person's life. They'll stop fighting you that moment, and you can get a, a grip on them from the behind and, and take them to the, to the shore. Christ is asking you tonight to stop fighting. Even though what He says might not make any sense to you, it really does work. If you want to be saved today, please bring Christ to your broken lives. If you need to repent of something, if you want the church to pray for you, come forward right now as together we stand and sing.